Welcome to the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, the Bayit, for tonight's opening panel on the topic of the enterprise of Jewish education. Are we succeeding? My name is Menachem Enchel, and I serve as Director of Synagogue Education and Programming here at the Bayit. In the words of our senior rabbi, Stephen Exler, Jewish education is so fundamental, so important an issue in our personal and communal lives that it is sometimes hard to know where even to begin the conversation. Although indeed it is sometimes hard to know where to begin the conversation, it isn't difficult to identify with whom to begin the conversation. Nina Bruder, local Riverdalian, is among the Bayat's pride and proud elite Jewish educators. For me, this idea of creating a space in our Bayat for a communal conversation around Jewish education, my personal passion and vocation, really blossomed as a chavruta, a partnership, that I've been proud to share with Nina in designing our series on Vishinantan, reflecting on our educational charge. I'm honored to welcome an illustrious group of colleagues to join Nina in tonight's conversation, featuring individuals impacting the field of Jewish education in real ways. Nina Bruder is the director of the Jewish New Teacher Project, the Jewish Day School Division of the New Teacher Center, a national non-for-profit educational organization that accelerates the effectiveness of new teachers and school leaders through mentoring. Nina served for almost a decade as the exec executive director of Bikurim, advancing new Jewish ideas, and before that at the Trisha Institute for Jewish Education. <coughs> Nina is also a guest lecturer at the NYU Wagner School for Public Service and the Wexner Foundation. A Wexner graduate alumna, Nina holds a BA from Brandeis University, a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, and studied for two years at the, the Pardes Institute for Jewish Studies in Israel. To learn more about Nina, please refer to the handouts. Friends, please join me in welcoming Nina Bruder. term with many dimensions. It might be my bias from the circles I'm in, but aside from Israel and these days the presidential election, no topic in my opinion gets talked about more than Jewish education, certainly among families with school-aged children. Why? Jewish education affects so many aspects of our lives. It's both personal and communal. It's both philosophical and institutional. It's a source of inspiration and a source of work. Education is a foundational principle of Jewish life. The Shinantan Levanecha is in our most elemental prayer, the Shema. Some say that the passing on of our Jewish teachings is what has held our community together for thousands of years. The Beit Midrash, or study hall, is seen as the hallmark setting for our Jewish learning. The literal translation of the word rabbi means my teacher. In this day and age, most Jewish educational structures are variations on the same models that have been in place for the Years. In the field of secular education, schools are on the brink of radical transformation, or so some say. We'll see if Jewish education follows with new trends that are emerging, such as utilizing technology for personalized learning, or rethinking schools and classrooms as the primary settings for instruction. But we'll save the topic of future trends for the next panel. Tonight's topic poses the question, how are we as a community doing? What has worked well and what hasn't? Where are there opportunities for meaningful Jewish learning? What does success look like? What needs improvement? A challenge to answering these questions is that communally speaking, our own definitions of success are not consistent. 
How do we know if what we are doing is what good if we aren't clear about what results we're looking for? What are we looking for? Is it that we want people to feel Jewish in a certain way? Do we want people to accumulate a certain amount of knowledge or mastery of language and texts? Do we want people to live a life infused with certain values that guide their sense of purpose in the world? Do we want people to live their lives according to halakha, however they understand it? Is it as simple as just wanting young people to want more, whatever that means? Where does emunah, belief in God, fit into it? Particularly relevant to families with children of a specific age, what colleges are our kids getting into? But how? I think we can all agree that nothing happens on its own. And addressing the topic of Jewish education is a huge undertaking. Fortunately, the Bay does not shy away from huge undertakings, which brings us to this evening. To help us take a hard look at some of these questions and to share reflections on the question, how are we as a community doing, we're honored to have with us tonight three exciting cutting-edge educators from three exciting cutting-edge Jewish institutions. Tonight's panelists have poured their hearts and souls into educating Jewish children. I know they have a strong fan base here tonight. We are blessed to live in a community filled with numerous experts on the topic of Jewish education. We could easily fill several more panels with experts just from within this community. In fact, I have in my backpack several articles written by people from the Bayi all related to Jewish education. But alas, we had to limit the number of sessions and number of panelists merely for scheduling purposes. A couple of notes about what these panels are not. I want to acknowledge that we do not have an either panel a representative from an after-school program, which is actually how most Jewish children in North America get their Jewish education. It's worth noting that the Bayit is unusual in that we actually have a religious school that meets after school, which most Orthodox and Hadars do not have. We are also not addressing early childhood education or preschool, though, relatedly, the focus of these panels actually is about educating children. We could easily fill another topic about adult education as well, you have the full bios of our panelists, so I won't repeat what you can read on your own, but I will just add a few words of introduction. Amy Scott Cooper is heading into her 19th summer <laughs> as director of Camp Raman Nayak. Many children from this community have attended that camp. Raman Nayak is unusual for a day camp because Amy actually runs two camps at the same time, one for children who attend during the day, and then after those kids leave, one in the evening for the counselors who live and sleep at camp all summer long and have their own Jewish educational curriculum designed specifically for them. Rabbi Aaron Frank <laughs> has worked in Jewish day schools for the past 14 years, both at Beth Tefillah in Baltimore and here in Riverdale at SAR High School. He also ran the Bayit Sunday School program a number of years ago. He is the incoming new head of school at Kinneret Day School. Both SAR and Kinneret have very strong ties to the body. Ilana Ruskay Kid <laughs> is an educational entrepreneur, having been involved with several educational startups, the most recent of which is the Sheffa School in Manhattan. The Sheffa School opened its doors in 2014 with 24 students. It now this year has 50 students has already outgrown its space and is expecting 75 students next year with a waiting list. The format for this evening is as follows. We've asked each panelist to prepare some opening remarks. I'll then follow up with some questions and give them each a chance to ask each other questions and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Some of you have sent in questions in advance for the panel and you should have access, I think, to pencils and papers to take notes or think of questions as we go uh, through the presentation. Um, you can hand them in along the way or save them for the question time. So without further ado, we thank you for coming tonight. We thank our panelists for coming tonight. And I invite Amy Scott to come and start our talk. Thank you, Erev Tov, everybody. And I really do feel like this is part of my body. I know so many of you here, and it's wonderful uh, to reconnect. Uh, and thank you so much for the invitation. We 
read in Masachet Sanhedrin, Ein Adam Lomed Torah, Ela Bamakom Shalibo Chafetz. A person learns Torah in a place that resonates in his heart, that stirs her soul. And I would say for me, along my Jewish journey, from childhood till this point, that I've been very fortunate. I've been a fortunate Jew, that I've had many stops along that journey where things have resonated in my heart and stirred my soul and moved me forward. And to talk about the day school community that I was part of and I graduated from with 12 fellow students. I would talk about the Jerusalem community in 1973 where we collectively heard the sirens that Yom Kippur afternoon. And my USY community, where we probably stood at virtually every free Soviet Jewry rally. And then the Ramah community. I started working at Camp Ramah when I was going into my senior year of high school. In fact, for some of you, and here is where we can really see the age divide in the room, my job that summer was to run the mimeograph machine. <laughs> Some of you know what that is, and this is when we were allowed to use as much paper as we wanted. It was politically completely correct, and I spent my summer basically going like this. But within a few days of being at Ramah, I realized this community is already providing meaning. I love this community so much. And then I did probably one of the more chutzpahdik things. On the first Friday night at an Onik Shabbat for staff, when I didn't know too many people, the director, and by the way, Rabbi Frank's director at the same time, came up to me and said, he was a camper, I was a staff member, just to clarify, and said to me, and said, so how is it going? And I looked at her and I said, I love this community. In fact, I think that I'd like to be a Ramah director. Now, I, was, I was 16 years old, and she could have looked at me. She, she probably was rolling her eyes, but she didn't show it. She didn't laugh. She didn't sort of give me that look of what kind of chutzpah. She looked at me, and she said at that moment, well, then we should talk about it. And that line, that one line has in many ways defined my own Jewish professional life that we need to take young adults and teenagers seriously. We need to take them very, very seriously because those lines, when they're beginning to think about it, we have the power to cultivate the next generation of leaders. So I know gathered in this room, because I know so many of you, there are generations of Ramanikim, and pre people who also probably like me can say, makom shali bi chafetz. And this year, Ramah, the movement, turned 70. We're marking it with the addition of a ninth camp, Ramah of Northern California, and are proud that in the past decade, we have continued to see remarkable growth, including Ramah in the Rockies, the Ramah Day Camp of Greater Washington, D.C. And these camps have added over 750 campers to Ramah, approximately 10% of our total camp, camper population which is wonderful growth for us. So what contributes to this Ramah success story? First, an understanding that it is not a story, but a long chapter book. A multitude of experiences that are high impact, include multiple touch points, and are geared for young children, pre-adolescents, teens, young adults, and even our alumni. They are designed to bestow among our participants Jewish ritual and cultural capacity and the ability to function as educated Jews in the outside world. When we get it right, we see peers living and learning together, forming enduring friendships, sharing a passion for Jewish life, and ultimately satisfying the need for Jewish meaning that so many of our young people want and need. But what goes into the formula? A formula that thrives on summer heat and ice cream and a commitment to excellence. Now I have to tell you that thankfully my chemistry teacher in my junior year of high school, when we spoke about formulas, really encouraged me to think about Jewish educational formulas and not chemistry formulas because she already saw that I would be more effective talking about Jewish educational formulas. 
But to take the idea of different formulas or different mixtures, I would suggest that these nine formulas go into success at Ramah. Number one, the right mix of intentionality and spontaneity. We think hard about educational theory and learning objectives and a spiraled approach to curriculum and a methodology that is tailored around those objectives. And we teach this approach to our younger staff. But at the same time, we welcome educational spontaneity, which sometimes leads to the highest impact moments at camp. It might be stopping everything because there's a rainbow and we want to bring everyone outside to learn the bracha for the rainbow. And it might be, and for those of you who are products of Nyack over the past 19 years, you'll understand this, that on a really, really, really hot day 19 years ago, we couldn't open camp inside the way we always had, so we brought the kids outside and someone had a tape recorder and put it on and the kids started to dance and the Migrash and Migrash dancing at Ramanaya was born. Number two, strategic planning and experimenting. We spend the right amount of time on strategic thinking and strategic growth, but we never allow ourselves to get paralyzed by process. New ideas are warmly welcome, as is experimentation, even when it's not part of a strategic map. And young adults know that my favorite line is, I have an idea. In fact, in our office, we have an idea room where they can come and sit and just create ideas. Number three, structured environments and creativity. We believe that the community flourishes because of the structure, the daily routine, the pace of the week, the time blocks. Do not suggest that camp is just a free for all. It is probably one of the most structured educational environments that exists. And we believe in Ramah that the structure leads itself to incredible creativity, which is welcome and embraced. Four, young adults and seasoned educators. Ramah has one of the largest senior staffs of rabbis and educators and psychologists and social workers and teachers and principals and understand that mentoring and training and supervising and role modeling and supporting young adults is critical to their success as future Jewish leaders. Yet the true magic of camp is because we can cultivate young adult role models who combine determination, passion, and most important, coolness, and I really mean it, into one amazing package. None of us in this room right now are still cool. Even you guys, you're not cool anymore, and we need, I'm sorry, but we need that coolness, and that's what an 18 and a 19 and 20 year old bring because we role model it and teach them. Number five, so while we're still, t while we're still talking about young adults, those who we desperately need to be the next cohort of day school teachers and Jewish professionals and even panelists. We understand that first we need to nurture them and make them feel completely comfortable in the homes that we build at camp. And from that nurture, hopefully, we're going to give them confidence. And from that confidence, we're going to be able to empower them and give them wings to go make the Jewish community what they want it to look like. So we go from nurture, to confidence building, to empowerment, to setting them off to go create on their own. Six, passion from the top coupled with passion from the base, which does not require any more explanation other than my belief that passion is responsible for the most success within the Jewish community. We need passionate people, and when we have them, their passion is contagious, and it fuels everyone else to be equally passionate. Seven, our commitment to Ivrit. Our formula includes Hebrew immersion and Hebrew infusion, and understanding that for many of our campers and staff, Hebrew infusion in a day predominantly spoken in English 
is an important principle and an attainable goal. Thanks to Avi Chai Foundation, we have spent the past six years recommitting ourselves to the goal of Hebrew infusion, training North American staff to become Hebrew ambassadors. And at NIAC, and with tremendous gratitude to the Aravim Philanthropic Group, we've also seen in the past three years that we can create a total Hebrew immersive program, a full day and a full summer only in Hebrew, and this summer have 80 children who will be participating in a full summer only in Hebrew. Eight, Ahavat Yisrael, an unyielding love for the land and people of Israel weave together with the openness to hear multiple narratives and voices. The first Shlichim came to Camp Ramah in Wisconsin in 1948. Imagine that. And what I will tell the 250 new Shlichim coming to all of our camps next week when I see them is that Shlichut and Israel and certainly Ramah have grown up and matured together. Our formula must include first and foremost an unyielding love for the land and people of Israel with then the ability to have nuanced conversation in a completely safe haven. And finally, a halachic eruv coupled with a spiritual eruv, which encourages joyfulness and growth and a commitment to tzaka and social action. Our ability to sustain that halachic eruv, that religious framework, in what we create a camp, a joyful, spirited, spiritual, non-judgmental, and happy setting. So there it is, it's a, it's a formula that is constantly being played with, <coughs> but each year it produces one great bug juice. The challenge, Stephen M. Cohn gave it to us just three weeks ago, and I quote him here, build more camps, and not just any camps, of course, but camps with an educational mission and purpose. Impact more people. Ramah is one of the most important programs for strengthening the Jewish future, period. We have an emergency in Jewish demographics, and Ramah needs to build more camps and influence more children, teens, and young adults. This is our climate change moment. We need to take the warning signs seriously and act now before it is not too late. We need more Ramah. Todaraba. So start with an era of tov, I guess, uh, learned in the same place. Um, I just first want to thank uh, the HIR, Nina, and Menachem. I'm just so proud to be a part of this incredible community here at the Bayit, a lifetime student of, of Avi who is here, a community that can never fully repay for the riches that it has given my family, and I'm blessed to speak here tonight. Um, I also want to thank uh, three institutions in my life, um, the Beth Dahan Community School in Baltimore, SIR High School here in Riverdale, and Kinara Day School Community Schools, and their yeshivas, and one is sort of a yeshiva and a community school in a weird way, um, places that have really given me the opportunities to reflect, to learn, to grow in this amazing um, journey of Jewish education. It's been a really good opportunity for me over the past couple weeks just to sort of think about where I've come from. Um, I'm so humbled to be on this panel uh, tonight, and I look out and there are people who are my teachers in Jewish education. I mean, so many of you have been my mentors, um, my colleagues, some of them we do have a camper here, so, yeah. um, so really it's uh, just a lot of fun. So I want to divide my time um, into three parts, and uh, in thinking a lot about how to use the time tonight. There's so much to talk about. Uh, and there are so many challenges that we in Jewish education share, um, whether that's relevant or connection, and all those things are very, very important. But after I spoke with Nina on the phone about this panel, I challenged myself to really think about how is the Jewish day school, that entity, a unique place in the Jewish educational landscape? What makes the day school 
different from the others? So that's going to be my first question tonight. Then, with the possible answer to that, how are we doing as day schools with the dynamic that day schools have uniquely, and how do we evaluate success? And also, what are the challenges that accompany the dynamics? So I'm gonna to try to do that all in, what was it? Eight minutes. Here we go. Okay. Um, I'd say in a word or in a sentence that the unique character of a day school is that we really expect almost everything out of it. Like, everything. I mean, we read this thing, day school education is the best predictor of Jewish identity, I guess, in every place they say that, right? They're in my office, they're camping, day schools, they say day schools is the best predictor, whatever, but I, in day schools they say that a lot. And it's a huge burden. We have a blessed obligation to shoulder so many goals at once. The first thing is, um, sometimes the reality is, it's school. It's school, you know? Um, school with fluency goals, measurable, clear-cut benchmarks that we want from school. Most of the goals that are school goals take place in the formal classroom setting, the structured schedule of the day, the day-to-day -day life of school. Tanakh, six times a week. Gemara, nine times a week. Hebrew, five times a week. Whatever those are, that's really those measurable school types of goals. But I think our community expects much more than this out of school, fairly or not. I think the community expects what I will call tonight affective results. Those are the results that come toward, from educating towards feelings, toward ruach, spiritual goals, and most of those goals, mostly, though not always, those take place outside of the regular schedule of a regular school day. Those affective goals are actually more associated with camps or youth groups. Those are the settings where affective goals seem to be most associated with, but I think every parent still wants those in school too. They want us to excellent general studies education, excellent literacy education in Judaics, and also please make my child very spiritually connected and rustic and all those kinds of things. And they all want it done here. And achieving success on the affective lens in the schoolhouse is a huge challenge. I was actually first introduced to this framing in a conversation I had with a friend and mentor, Rabbi Jeff Sachs, at the Mandel School in Jerusalem a number of years ago. We talked actually about Bronx science and why that kind of specialty school is interesting to compare with the specialty school that is a religious school. So let's look at Bronx science, or a school like Bronx science. At Bronx science, everyone attending understands the goal. Right? Certainly there's going to be some variation. I'm sure on their panel they talk about the variation. But as a whole, the goal is pretty clear. Right? The kids want maximum knowledge acquisition of science, of math, of those types of literacy benchmarks. The parents, all committed to that literacy acquisition. Benchmarks, those are clear indicators of future success in math and science. But Bronx science is pretty easy. What's a success? Someone who does well in math and science, in class and on tests. That's success. But in many ways, Jewish day schools and religious schools are nothing like that. It's very different. Yes, in the yeshiva day school and in the community day school, no matter what, that's the place that parents, and rightfully so, expect the Aleph Bets and the Rashis to be learned. It's the space where parents send their children to school and our community expects literacy results. And while it, certainly emotional and spiritual education is seen as important, those are the things that you sort of try to squeeze in while school is going on, between periods or at a special program. So in day schools, the challenge is huge. Infuse religious literacy with the critical need to speak with the religious and spiritual growth of our children so essential to carrying a strong Jewish identity in adulthood. We see, we have to do both of those things. And so, however, so when thinking about it more, while we see the literacy goals as the primary investment in school as far as time, actually what I think schools sell most is not the literacy goals. I sort of did some shy, went around on websites, looked at videos, things that are going on in school, go check out 
the latest emails from your kid's school, or your grandkid's school, or your ne nephew's school, or your niece. The truth is, almost all the time, they don't sell literacy, right? Think of the emails that you got this week, okay? We have um, watch highlights from today's ONA, watch the basketball championship, see our guest speaker on the Yom Yun, view pictures of the school wide chesed day or from color war. Those are the things that we see mostly. And while, yes, we put pictures of kids learning, the truth is, it's rare that we say, take a look at what happened in 11th grade accelerated Gemara today. Watch these kids nail a toast vote. Like, people aren't like, whoa, want to see that? So it's really the affective goals that are at least equally, if I think sometimes mostly emphasized, as each school asserts how it can strengthen and transform Jewish life and identity for our youth. I also went to the school's missions. So again, not a scientific study, I only had a couple weeks. But when you look at the words that are used in mission statements, I took about five schools. So here are the words. And try to think how many have to do with literacy education and how many have to do with affective education. Here we go. Intellectual curiosity, that'll go in the, affect, in the literacy one. Religious growth, kindness, passion, challenging academics, okay. Kihila, identity, kavod. Living Torah values, stimulating Torah learning and developing a love of and commitment to the state of Israel. It's just interesting. So while certainly the book and the classroom should be sort of the source, the place where it springs off of, I actually think that the affective plays a huge part in expectations from parents in the community in day schools. So with all of these demands, the demands to address all these goals at once, how can we in day schools evaluate success? So we'll start with the easy part. The literacy goals are sort of easy to evaluate. We have benchmarks, and there's a standard, standards and benchmarks committee now at JTS that's doing amazing work. So benchmarks for Jewish literacy. If you've learned a certain number of prakim or dapim or can read the Israeli newspaper, you have succeeded. That is literacy success. If you can lead tefillah, you have succeeded. And the BJEs here in New York are the perfect example of this. A certain score gets you into a certain school. It's not the only thing, but you need that to get into a certain school. And it gets you into certain classes. And those how, are how we measure the literacy success of our schools. And how, though, do we take a measure of the affective success of our school? Those measures are just so much less tangible, so much less measurable. I think we'd all agree that a successful day school student is not only one who can end up going to Gush or high-level yeshiva or Harvard or has scored high on his or her tests, but it's the student who actually leads her college campus. It's the student that organizes his pro-Israel rallies or arranges for Shabbat meals. Those are successes of Jewish day schools in the affective realm. It's also the student who claimed to be an atheist for the first three years of high school and is now on the Hillel board of her university. That's affective success. It's the child who learned to bake at the feet of a fifth grade teacher, how to bake challah, and now in college, that may be the only thing he does to observe Shabbat. That may be a success, that may not be a success, depending on who you are. It could also be an adult who all through college went to frat parties, and then, when they're 24, and when we took the evaluation of their success when they were 18, we said, oh, that guy's definitely a failure. Well, now he's 24, and he volunteers to do a Shabbat program at a Hebrew home. Maybe success is just very, very hard to get our arms around when it comes to measurements in affective realm. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about um, Avichai types of surveys and surveys about success in Jewish education. And I was looking at the categories. So all the categories they have, you know, in almost every single one, and I know there are people here who maybe wrote those surveys, so if I'm wrong, please let me know. Thanks, Dan. Um, I mean, I never saw in any of them, like, knows Treasar by heart, um, or like, can recite the three elements of the Rosh Hashanah Musaf. Like, that's not the thing. Almost all of them, and while there are things about, like, going to Shurim regularly and having Chavrusas, and those are very nice, Almost all of them are really about affective education. Again, it could be grounded in the book, 
but it really comes through those things, like gives to Jewish causes, do you visit Israel regularly, do you marry Jewish, has Shabbat dinner, going to shul, observing holidays. With these type of, school, of goals as the benchmark, it's really hard for day schools to figure out if we're successful. It's really hard. And even people at the same day school who sit around the same table can define success differently. It's easy to define success by the score on the Tanakh test. How we define success for what we've really infused as far as af those affective goals are very, very difficult. And it's interesting that I actually think that it's an unstated expectation of our community to hit those affective goals at least equally, if not maybe even more successfully than the literacy goals. I mean, it's hard because the challenge is, is that you have to have school. And it's an environment where kids are pressured, their expectations for their performance, and we have to do all those things at once. So here is the central challenge. At best, how can day schools fulfill being bearers of both literacy and affective goals? And maybe even, how can the school succeed when much of the success is defined by actually the thing we do the least, which is the special programs? Truth is, I actually think that we'll pat ourselves in the back. That my preschool, one of my preschool college, colleagues used to say, we'll pat ourselves in the back. I actually think we do a pretty good job in day schools. I think our schools are successful and many kids and parents sort of get that balance, but it really is an everyday challenge. How much do we demand from our kids without turning them off? Sometimes we push them too hard and they associate everything with Judaism, and then we turn them off. How much balance do we put in the schedule to address these very high expectations? And I think navigating the dynamic of literacy, education, and affective education is one of the things that inspires me to be in school every day, just walking the halls and talking to students. I love working in schools. The truth is I always thought I'd be a camp person, and then I realized, and we sort of battle this out as to what's the most meaningful, I realized actually like there's two months of seeing kids every day in camp, and then there's like 10 months in school. And so, but we have to deal with like work in school. So like whatever, it's a balance, but I love it because every day for 10 months you have the kids there. And it's really where the kids spend the majority of their waking lives. On the one hand, it's really the place that's really the most monotonous place for them, but it's in that routine where we, we really have the blessed challenge to infuse the head and the hearts with as much meaningful meaning as possible. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. I have to say, having been born and bred in the, on the Upper West Side, we tend to think that the Upper West Side is the center of the Jewish community. So it's quite wonderful to come here to Riverdale and see all so many of my favorite people also here. So um, it's humbling for me, and I'm going to have to reconsider um, my position about the Upper West Side. And I'm privileged to be, to, be, to be joining all of you and to be welcomed to this, with this esteemed panel. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that we were asked to think about was sort of to describe the Jewish educational enterprise, which seemed like a very lofty question within five to eight minutes. Um, certainly, I'm not going to be able to do it in five to eight minutes, but I wanted just to touch on some of the things that I was thinking about around that topic. I would say the first question was, what were we doing well? I think that there is some innovation, and I think what is exciting and what certainly you can hear is both, the, both that, that there is innovation from within and that there are also projects of all kinds. I had the opportunity last year to be part of Bikurim where I got to see all kinds of startup, Jewish startups that were doing all kinds of things. Um, and I believe that there is an excitement and I think that there's a realization that we are sometimes just sort of talking to one another, that everybody in this room is engaged. Everybody in this room, I'm gonna guess, has some connection to a synagogue or to a day school or to a Jewish camp. And we can feel quite good if we all sit with one another and can, we can both complain about the small stuff, but fundamentally the community is talking to us. Uh, and one of the questions that I really think about a lot, and clearly the statistics are starting to show us, is that there are a lot of people who don't feel like we're talking to them. And we're not talking to them for lots of different reasons. Um, but I think it's something that we want to take seriously, and I think that as we spend a lot of time on drawing lines and deciding who's in and who's out, what's right and what's wrong, that often what we end up doing is leaving a lot of people feeling irrelevant and feeling like outsiders. Um, and people, and that, for, uh, that when we, we, we talk about our Jewish values, but the question of what it really means to live our Jewish values and what it means for Jewish institutions to begin every day, every moment, the way in which they interact with one another, the way that they interact with the outsider as they define it, are all important benchmarks to me, much more than what we say. 
um, is what we do. And that I think that we have a serious challenge ahead of, ours, uh, ahead of us. And if we look at the demographics of what's going on in our community, what we are seeing is that there is tremendous diversity. And as the community is porous, and as we're welcomed into these communities, that we want to, you know, that I think we have a responsibility and a big question and challenge of what it means for us to become, in fact, a community that people want to be a part of. Because nobody anymore has to be a part of it. And so the question is, do they want to? And is there something compelling about what we're doing that makes them feel? that they want to be a part. I would say another thing that I'm starting to see that I'm pleased about is that there is collaboration between institutions. And I hope that this can happen more. We have limited resources. We have the limited resources of space, something that we can feel the most here living in New York City. We have, the limit, we have limited resources of money, of talent, and of time. And there's no excuse to keep reinventing the wheel or diverting resources when there is so much work to be done. One of the things that I've been thinking about around this issue of limited resources around talent, and Amy, you really spoke to that question. When I, when I had the privilege of supervising the camp at the JCC in Manhattan, and what I watched were these <coughs> magnificent counselors, one after another after another, who cared about children, who cared about the values, who were turned on to what was happening Jewishly at the JCC camp. And then I would ask them, you know, would you ever think, of, I was always looking for good teachers, and I'd say, would you ever think about coming to work in our school? Oh no, I'm not gonna become a teacher. And I know for myself that when I graduated, when I graduated from Harvard, pretty much to a T, everyone said, you're going to go now and become a teacher? It was as if I had said I was going to go and pump gas at the gas station. And I think that, I think things have changed a little bit, but I don't think they've changed that much. And I think the question of what we do and how we take those 16, 17, 18-year-olds 18 who are full of passion and full of commitment and how we make them think that this is a serious career, that this is something that requires more than just showing up or babysitting children, which is often what it's seen, and how we help them to think that we actually need their talent and that if we really want to do something inspiring, it's all about the people. And we all know that, and, and, the, and I think it's a question of how we bring them into the field, how we train them, how we value them, how we pay them, how we grow them, how we speak to them. One of the things that I'm sure people on this panel will, will, will agree with is one of the issues is how parents speak to the Jewish professional, professionals, but certainly to, to the educators who work for us, and what does it mean, what's our role in stepping in when in fact it feels like they're being disrespected or not appreciated? How do you create a culture in a school where in fact the culture is not about fetching, but the culture is saying thank you? I can't tell you the number of times where, where teachers will work hard and send an email, or write a newsletter, or write a report card, and then they'll say, nobody even responded. Did they read it? And I have to assure them, I'm sure they read it. They just didn't occur to them to say thank you, or to say that's so interesting, or thanks for taking the time, or I'm so glad to hear that my child is doing all these amazing things that my child is doing. But I think that that actually adds up. And it starts to make teachers feel like they're talking. And I think that technology is both a wonderful tool, and it sometimes means you feel like you're talking out into the air. And I think that we're all guilty of it. I think we're all also the recipients of lots of emails that we ignore or that we read but we don't respond and say thanks or how interesting. But I think it's something um, that's really important and we, and we need it if we want to continue to grow the kinds of institutions that we're growing. Um, I, talk, I, I guess I would start talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about the Sheffa School. So the Sheffa School is a Jewish day school for kids with language-based learning disabilities. We opened as in, with, last year with 24 students. And it really came, it was a conversation that I think has been going on for tens of years in many, many places. And it was, to me, really about those kids who were the outsiders, those kids who weren't seen, those kids who felt small. And I think a lot about the container in which these things happen. I had, a, I had the privilege of spending a summer doing a pre-feasibility study. I interviewed and had coffee with tens and tens and tens of parents. And what I heard from them, for those families who were in secular private or public schools who had to leave the, a school to go to a special, a school for kids with special needs. They often were angry at the school. They were angry at the teacher, they were angry at the principal, they were angry at the psychologist. Somebody had probably usually done something wrong in terms of the way in which it was handled. Some of which was probably just the messenger, they were angry at the messenger, and some of it is that it also it's very hard to, to deliver these kinds of messages in effective ways in effective ways. And often they'd say, I'm not going to give a dollar to that school or I'm not walking back into that school. But when I interviewed families who had been parts of Jewish day schools, Jewish nursery schools, Jewish communities where, they were, where that same thing happened, the language that they used at the end was that they felt betrayed by the Jewish people. It wasn't, I'm angry at this school or that school, but they felt pushed out of the whole community. And they couldn't avoid it in the same way. Because while you may never walk into PS 87, you may never walk into Dalton again, every time that they walked into a Shabbat dinner, 
or every time they went to some, the friend's bar mitzvah, or every time that they had a shiva and they saw that their day school kids' families came and visited at the shiva, but their kids who were in the special ed schools' parents didn't come to the shiva because they didn't understand that that's what you do, you show up at shiva when your grandparent dies. That each one of those moments, those families feel hurt and rejected. And the children feel like outsiders. And the question that I, be that I began to think about is, what kind of container can we have? What, what's the, what happens in these containers? So one of, the, one of the reasons that Jewish camp is so effective, I believe, which it certainly is, is that children, of course, love the Jewish life that happens in camp. But they also love everything else that happens in camp. So they associate playing Gaga and hanging out with their friends and picking grass with being in a Jewish community. And that is where it happens. And similarly, when a child is in a Jewish day school where they feel badly about themselves, or they watch their friend who is, who is struggling and the teacher is not able to serve them, that it affects the way that they feel about that, about that container as well. And that if we could flip it around, and if we could think about what happens if in a Jewish container children could learn to read, and if in a Jewish container a child could start to feel their shefa, their abundance inside of them, and that if in that container they could all of a sudden start to feel more relaxed and, they're, and all of a sudden, the homework that they're doing with their parents no longer is a, an area for tears, stress, and hysteria, but instead it's something that they knew that they could confidently do, that that would affect not just the way they feel about themselves, but the way in which they feel about Jewish life. Um, and, I, and, and I think that, it's, that we all work to create those kinds of containers, but I think that the container is more than what's, what we think we're teaching about Purim or what it is that we think we're doing about how, how good our swim instruction is, but it's really about the way in which children feel and then how parents feel. One of the things that I would say was very, a guiding principle for us as well was that we were going to use the best practices, the best practices, full stop. That meant that we were going to look at the secular world and that we were going to look at the Jewish world to see what was out there. That we know that we are, it's one of the privileges of being in a community that is not Jewish community, not just a Jewish community, but there's so much good things that are going on out in the world. And that we were going to really build on those, that we were not going to reinvent the wheel. And that we were not going to do it if we were going to do a schlocky job. That if in fact that we were going to create a sort of suboptimal Jewish, Jewish school, but they were going to eat challah, that we were actually going to, it wasn't fair to those students or to those families to pull their students out, and they shouldn't come to the Shefa school. They should, in fact, go to that secular school where they're going to get an excellent education because kids know the difference. And kids know the difference between when we take them seriously and when we give them quality and when it, we're just saying, don't worry, honey, and we're just sort of um, hoping somehow that they're going to, um, they're going to like it because we're going to do a few things that are, that are Jewish. Um, and, that, and, that, and that, that there's a cycle of confidence and competence. And for children to be able to feel confident, they also need to be competent. And so that balance that you're really talking about, about how much is text and how much is the feeling, that these things are actually very much related. And that for a child to be able to arrive at the Shabbat table and feel like they belong, they need to know what's going on. They need to know the Kiddush. They need to know what the Parsha of the, of the Shavu is so that they can actually have a conversation with their sibling who might know something. And so we really try to have that balance of both being able to give them content and a sense of, con of, con of confidence um, and also understanding that, we were, that the idea was not to replicate the problem and just continue to sort of shove and rush things into them because we knew that that wasn't for these students, for any student, but certainly for our kids, that they needed things deeper, slower, and in a, in a way that was going to help meet their, their learning needs. When we look at our successes and where our, our failures, I would say that one of the ways that we measure our success is children's learning and progress. It's certainly something that we can see. Is a child reading more than they were reading before? Are they being able to solve math problems they couldn't? Are they able to express their ideas in more clear and coherent ways? Another thing we look at is their emotional state. How do they seem? They just seem happier, and that's something that we also really can feel and see. What's the, what's the reality for, their fa for our families? Has it changed for them? When we interview families in a, before they come, it's exhausting to hear what their lives look like. When we hear about how hard they're working to piece all the, the pieces together to keep their children um, in, to, in the school that they are in, and to keep their child intact, and to get the homework done, and so we look at that. The other thing that we look at is, our, is we're a pluralistic Jewish day school, and we have really a privilege of pluralism at the, at the Shefa school. Because people don't have as many choices, people come to the Shefa school not because they're committed to pluralism, but because they really want a good specialized Jewish education. And it means that families travel from far, and, travels, and they travel from far from a religious 
perspective. I never in my wildest fantasies imagined we'd have the kind of pluralism that we have in our school. And what's beautiful about it is it's allowed us to celebrate, celebrate our differences and that that's really what it's all about is celebrating differences. And um, I would say it's something we look at and from my perspective, when, we, when, we, when, we, when a parent will pause and ask us a question or say this made me a little uncomfortable, I think it means we're doing our job. It means that we've created a community where parents feel comfortable enough to say, I was wondering about that, or what do you think about that, or have you ever considered doing more of this or less of that? So to me, being able to be able to have those conversations is a, is a privilege, and people don't feel like they can walk out. And so it's allowed us instead to have to figure out how to work together and live together. I would say the last piece is really about um, our role as being part of the larger conversation. What is what we feel really, it's been very important for us to partner with the Jewish day schools. We want to be seen as a partner with them, as all of us working together. I'm always struck and moved by the extent to which all of the schools are actually really working to serve as many students as they can, as well as they can with very limited resources. And the question of how can we both support them? I think we have a whole lot more to do. How can we help to be able to better define what we can do, what they can do, how they could do what they are doing better? They, I think that that is a larger question. And I think that as special needs has sort of continued to move into the center of people's realities, there's pressure. And I think that's good pressure. I think it's hard pressure, but I think that it's good pressure and that the schools are really, are thinking more and more about how they can do, do that job better of serving a larger, group of students and also to be able to know what which, which students they're unable to serve and to be able to have honest conversations with families when that comes to be the point. Because while we always think being inclusive is the best thing for, for everybody, that if we in fact cannot serve children or their families, we've not necessarily done them a great service by keeping them in our schools or in our, in our schools. I would say the other piece that, that sort of keeps me up at night is that we don't serve all children with special needs who want a Jewish setting. There's a lot more work to be done. And we certainly, when we went and spoke to lots of experts, they all said, you need to pick a population and you need to do it well. And we pick language-based learning disabilities because it's the largest group in terms, of the, in terms of kids with learning disabilities. But there are so many students who we can't serve. And my hope, and, and certainly as we look ahead, our hope is that there will be more. That either there'll be more schools or we'll be able to build more capacity or the day schools will be able to say, but we can do this part. And that I think together we, could, we can start to, um, to, to chip away at this tremendous project of really making all children feel like they're, they have a place within the Jewish community. Um, and so I'm looking forward to further conversation with him. This microphone is for the live stream feed, and we're all going to turn on our lavalier mics also. Let's just do a sound check. You can hear me? Other people, you can hear Yes, Amy's mic. So I'm going to pose a few questions to our panelists. I'm going to give them a chance to ask each other any questions that have come to mind, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. You all spoke so beautifully and movingly about the work that you do. Um, it was so inspiring to hear kind of the, the passion coming through. Um, I, want to, I want to drill down on some of the things that feel like they might be rubbing points and see if we can bring that out a bit. Um, I'm going to put my first question to Amy, which is the, how do you, you, see, you know, we had two day school representatives on this panel and camp represented. How do you see the relationship? Um, I know at Ramah Nayak in particular, which is the Ramah camp I know the best, you have students from day schools, you have students from public schools. How do you see the role of Ramah, and I'll broaden it beyond Nayak, having an, an educational intention and purpose in relationship to the other Jewish educational opportunities in the Jewish community? Um, well, at Ramah, just a little bit of de demographics. Thank you. A little bit of demographics at Ramah. Um, approximately 50% of the kids are day school kids, and the other 50% of the kids are um, religious school, or with the case of day campers sometimes, um, still undecided and have a few years before they're deciding on a trajectory of what kind of Jewish education they're giving their kids. I, I think for 
both populations, um, both the day school the, and the and the religious school populations, it's to again create this environment where everyone feels very, very comfortable. In terms of intentionality and curriculum, like we, we want to make sure that what we're doing, we're not duplicating a curriculum that's being taught in the day school or in the religious school. Uh, we want to think a little bit more broadly about what are some of the pieces that that frankly, you might not have time for, but that would really resonate with the kids. We also want to make sure that our offerings are very diverse, reflecting the diversity of the kids. So let's say in, a, in an entering fourth grade division in camp, children um, will be offered a wide variety of different types of Jewish um, discussions and programs during the, during the course of the summer. They can include anything from serious text study to, um, to doing more on the fine arts and the performing arts with a Jewish dimension because we want to make sure that, that every type of child coming from different backgrounds and every type of learner feels comfortable at camp. Uh, but just one more thing I would add to it, Nina, is that um, because um, um, we're in the summer and there are so many people that it's their quiet season, um, we love to open ourselves up as a community for day school educators and Jewish professionals to come visit during the summer because ultimately what makes this work is partnership. And I love that you said that we need each other. We need to talk to each other. We share staff. We share ideas. And the more that the silos continue to be broken down and there's a real partnership and that we feel welcome in each other's institutions, we learn and grow from each other on for our children and also for us professionally. I know that there have been some efforts to the bring camp to school and to link curricula from day schools to camps and back and forth. Um, that's a big leap to make, but at least the, the communication is beginning. Um, a question to Aaron: In your day-to-day -day work, what altitude do you generally spend your time at? Are you in the kind of um, thinking about education and pedagogy? Are you thinking about Judaism and transmitting uh, Jewish content? Are you thinking about implementation and logistical details and who's where, when? Can you give us an insight into that? Um, I've done, a, in my 14 years in day schools, I've served in different, uh, in different roles in different day schools, but in, in some cases I've been more heavy on the logistical pieces in some of, uh, of the areas in which I've worked, I've been more heavy on staff development and working with staff. And one of the things I've really uh, enjoyed and loved in my time at SAR is really being in the classroom more and, and focusing on pedagogy and being part of a team. Um, but I think the biggest piece when I was reflecting on this is that I think that in day schools, we tend to bifurcate these issues so much. It's like, I've been to like a million conferences about like, are you really spending your time doing education? Or are you spending your time like dealing with buses? Now, I, I understand like what's behind the question, um, but in this really, I have to say the true Hakarata Tov goes to Camp Ramon, my training there is like everything matters. Like there's no, I never, I've, ne I've spent a lot of time talking about educational methodology. I've been at the Harvard Principal Center, and I've also uh, been one who uh, changed an entire 200-car carpool line in one day and almost got tomatoes thrown at me. And all of those moments were like educational moments. So I just don't, I understand the question, but I actually think that each one of them like brings along an incredible educational opportunity. Um, even in that like carpool day that I like will never forget. I was like, everyone will listen to me. And that didn't exactly happen, but I learned a lot. And um, there are parents even to this day who I'll see after years whose kids were in my school, like, do you remember that day? And like, that may be the biggest day they remember. They poured like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into their kids' Jewish education. And that engagement with me, I hope, was one where they saw you know, like an easygoing, happy Jewish role model. And uh, you just never know where it's going to come. It's going to come. It could come at a faculty meeting. It could come at a panel about Jewish education. And it could come when you're serving Jello on the lunch line. There's just, 
the bifurcation, I understand it, and I think we have to think about it, but it always is, it's not something that I, I really stay up at night thinking about that much. One question for um, Elana. I was going back and forth between a few. This is one that actually was written in in advance um, about the cost of day schools. And I thought I would put this to you because I'm guessing that the cost of a special ed day school is even higher than the cost of already really, right? It's an option that keeps kids in the day school setting. But I wonder if you can just speak to, you know, I think that that's a huge communal challenge. I don't think it's the chef of schools problem. I think it's the North American Jewish community's problem. But I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think clearly that the the question of, of day school cost is a fortune and I've a big one, and I've experienced it both personally and professionally. And I would say a few things. I think that actually we are um, the chef of school is actually we, one of the things that we look at is we benchmark ourselves against is the secular special ed schools, and we have put ourselves below the price of the secular special ed schools. I wanted, and we did that because we wanted to be affordable. We are still a very expensive school. Um, but one of the things that we also know and learned here is that in order to offer a quality education, it costs a lot of money. And that if you want to do, goes back to the question, if you want to do a good job, it's going to cost money. I mean, I would say we work very hard to, have worked very hard to raise money so that we've been able to have a strong financial aid model. And um, we are proud to be able to offer that. We also have another very good loophole that works for us, which is that the way that it works in New York City, and New York City is extremely unique in this way, is that because children are entitled to a free and appropriate education, it means that almost all of our New York City families hire lawyers and sue the city. It's a crazy process. They have to do it every year. Some of you are nodding, so some of you have heard about it. Um, but what it means is that um, they have a very high success rate. So in our school, and this is true of many of the special ed schools, and it's even been easier with de Blasio, has been that all of our families who have sued the city have had settlements. And those settlements are often, um, they don't they don't cover the, the Jewish part. And when they look at our schedule, that's not all, you know, they may, they usually deem between 15 and 20% as the Jewish part, but that other 80%, they can get 90, 95% of that um, support. So we've been very lucky in that our New York City families actually have found sort of another way to make it affordable. Um, but it doesn't solve the bigger question that solves sort of the chef a problem, but it doesn't solve the problem of the question of how we really do that. Say that again? I said that we didn't get that one. <laughs> no, it's a real challenge. It's really a challenge. And as I said, I think that the, it, I think sacrificing quality is not the answer to this question. So, and I think paying teachers less is also not the, the, the solution to this problem. Do you want to yeah, I just wanted to add that I think that um, a model that I very much believe in that I did a, tried to do a little bit in Baltimore, we did a little bit of it, is really doing a lot of resource sharing, not just on the big topics and talking together about how can we communicate, but like actual resource sharing as far as sharing advertisements, putting a cap on PR budgets, those kinds of things. I think if we as a community could find a way to speak the same language, and um, that's going to take, and I think it, 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 it's time, um, it's going to take people stepping back and being a little humble and saying, I'm not going to produce 25 videos and have 30 glossy brochures. Look, you know, I think the NFL salary cap is like $225 million, but everybody agreed to stay under a certain cap for that gazillion dollar industry that is, and I think that we hesitate to do it, and I just don't really understand why the only thing I ever come back to is sort of like, there's, and I, I, I'm a part of it, I guess, in some levels, there's sort of like a selfishness, you know, like, we're great if everybody shares, but we still want to have 10 bands play at our events, you know, and so like, we all are going to have to step back and try to sort of play better with each other in the sandbox in order for affordability to really become um, a real commitment. Before we turn to the audience questions, I just want to give each of you a chance, if any of you has a question you want to ask of the other panelists. Okay, um, I'm gonna, we, we um, to the people who registered in advance, we offered them the opportunity to send in questions in advance. So I'm gonna, we've covered some of them in the remarks, but there's one that um, hasn't been covered yet. So I'm gonna read it on behalf of someone who sent it in, and then we'll give people who are here in person the chance. Um, this is, uh, 
the first question that came in actually. While Jewish education is a chief concern and responsibility for families, is there ever a concern that it can keep families insular, only interacting with one another and not concerned or engaged with the larger world? Who wants, who wants it? <laughs> I mean, I think the question is, I think that's, our, I think a few things. I would say having had the privilege of working with many families working, looking at kindergartens, I used to always say to them once they were agonizing about which kindergarten was the perfect kindergarten for their child, that no, that no school is, offers a complete diet. And so I think one of the things that we need to help parents understand is, is that schools actually can't do all of it. And so to the extent to which if you're in a school that has only Jewish children, you might want to think about how are other opportunities, forget what the school's going to do, that you as a family are going to start to think about what baseball team do you go to? Where do you eat at dinner? What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing with your own time? Who are your friends? I mean, I think that those are questions that we need to look at a little bit ourselves. That, that I think takes some of the responsibility off of, of any school because school, and it may be a great school, they don't have a great sports program. And then there's all of those questions of what schools have and what, and, and I think it's too much responsibility to assume that a school is responsible for everything about making, raising our children. And still I think families raise children. Um, and I think it's important for families to take that responsibility. The second thing I would say is that I think it's a, it's a primary com responsibility of a school to help children understand and engage with the world in which they live. And the world in which they live is not just their, you know, their neighborhood, their block, their community, but is about their, both the children, helping children have a sense of themselves as responsible for this larger world in which they live, for children to understand this larger world in which they live, for children to ask questions about it, for children to go out in it, and that that's really about the kind of pedagogy and the kind of education that we create within our classrooms, because I think we have, we have an added responsibility, because there may, some kinds, of, some of the diversity is not going to be in that classroom. So one of the questions that I think we always want to to wrestle with is how are we going to bring those other voices in? Maybe there's someone in the classroom who's going to ask that hard question that we want the children to wrestle with, but maybe there isn't. And so then the question is, what's the role of the school or of the teacher to be able to bring that voice in so the children also have a chance to hear that other perspective or to think about that other perspective? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I think it's interesting. I've worked in a community school setting and a yeshiva day school setting. And um, I actually think that often people come into it almost from the other, from the opposite sides. I think that in community day school, I often was, I often felt that many of the families felt that actually going to a Jewish school was broadening them. <laughs> you know, like they're from the prep school world and like, whoa, I would even try a Jewish school? Like, that's crazy to me. So for some... It's that way. Um, for the others, I, a dynamic that I see um, at SAR and in the modern Orthodox community, and I think there's a lot to talk about with what I'm about to say, is that I actually think that there is a fear of insularity. Um, I think that um, we're living in a world, and as I was telling one of my students today, all you have to do is turn on CNN when you all get home tonight, in which people are, um, in which circling the wagons is, has become uh, the va a value of the day. Um, and, um, you know, in this morning's Times, uh, David Brooks wrote a piece on the culture of fear. And in a culture of fear, people are circling the wagons. And, they're, um, and that issue of insularity, I think, is, uh, in my time, it's more important and more visible than ever. Okay, let's open the mics up to the people who are here. Um, Menachem. You can use that mic for the, I can turn this off, put this down. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you for sharing that story. Are there other questions? I just want to, I agree with you. Um, I'll just say something pretty brief, but it's a huge question. I, I don't think we've, I talked about sort of these differences of the literacy, education, and affective. I have to be honest with you, I don't think we've figured it out yet. I think that grading Tanakh ability or is tefillah something that should be graded or I, I don't, I don't, I, I think that we're kidding ourselves if we feel like we've solved it. Um, on the one hand, I certainly feel like we have to hold kids to task and make them realize that their Jewish education and their Judaic studies is of, is of extreme importance. I think everyone would agree with that. The next question I don't really know if I would agree with even is, does that mean I have to give them the same grades and expectations that they have in AP history? And um, I think that that really is a very, very big question that I think that we have to continue to grapple with. And, I, and that, that could take some of that pressure off, but I think we're all worried that the price of that would be that our children would think that, oh, it's just, you know, we all have heard this. It's just, I just have a Tanakh test tomorrow. It's not a real test. So, like, we want to be able to push against that while not making it on the same level. And I don't think we've figured it out yet, to be very honest with you. I just want to say, though, that again, like, I think we need to encourage educators to feel like they're allowed to be the educators. I think that often there's a lot of pressure. Families feel pressure. Teachers feel pressure. Schools feel pressure. There's a lot of noise. And what my experience is that often that when educators say, this is what I think is actually best for your child, parents are relieved that there's a way in which there's a lot of noise and they don't always know necessarily which should they be worried that they need to take six APs? Should they, do they need six hours of homework? And that I think that sometimes it's also our jobs and then if each one 
one of us is able to take a stand and say, we're going to try our best to make a sane choice and turn off the noise and forget the fact that the other school is doing it differently or another history teacher is doing it in a different way, but that we're going to make a choice that we think has integrity, that often my experience has been parents say thank you. And that the truth is that most people are not feeling great about all this pressure that we're putting on our kids. And it, you know, there's obviously been more and more movies, The Race to Nowhere. I mean, there's increasing attention to this, but there's sort of there's sort of two conversations going on. There's this meta conversation, and then there's sort of what your child comes home with every single night, and then the and the and not just what it does to the child, but what that whole family dynamic becomes about. You know, all the six hours yeah, of homework. Our general studies teachers have to realize they they work in a day school, and it's just not. Even during the summer, I think that um, parents um, put so much, often put so much pressure on kids during the summer that um, in terms of ac even activity selection and, and, and the, the, the level of, of um, even post-camp sport instruction just to make sure that, that there is enough that a child can get accepted to a certain team or have a certain position is... Um, is sometimes alarming and um, is always balanced with um, the need that kids have during the summer, um, that they have during the year but just never get it, but during the summer to have within a safe camp community free play. Like there's nothing that's happier than kids playing in mud and climbing safely trees and painting trees and just being, um, and uh, so trying to balance the need for, for excellence in programming but also allowing for that freedom and giving the kids a, an opportunity to take a deep breath outside and telling parents that's okay is really important. I think we probably can take three more questions. So, Laura. Um, I also teach at SAR, um, and we spent a great deal of time this year thinking about and talking about Israel education. And I wanted to ask the panelists um, how you're dealing with Israel education's change in this new past few years of a great deal of dialogue in the press and among the educators about what we're doing wrong in Israel education, that we're, we're perhaps giving only one perspective, we're not allowing other viewpoints in, and thereby raising a generation of kids who go off to college and are then furious with us and turn anti-Israel because they felt they were lied to or that they only got one slice of the pie in terms of a perspective. So I wanted to see what camps and schools are doing in order to grapple with and think about this new turn in terms of psychics. I've been asked to repeat the questions for the purposes of the live stream. I will summarize. Um, how are your institutions dealing with teaching about Israel in the current political climate? Well, again, it's, you know, like what I said about camp at the beginning, camp is not just a story. It's, it's many, many chapters in a story. And um, it starts with a strong foundation of Ahavat Yisrael, of a love, um, an, an unyielding love for Israel um, through um, curriculum, but more importantly, through relationship. And, and um, camp has the ability to Camps uh, have the ability to bring in a very large group of young, dynamic Israelis post-army to be there and to be a strong presence in camp. Um, what, what do our Israelis ask us, and what will they ask us next week as we start training them? What, do I have to bring just the, the, um, the camp version of Israel, or what is the version of Israel that I bring? And the answer that we give is bring yourselves, meaning once kids get to the, the, the adolescent years and for young adults, they want to hear your narrative and your opinions, and it is okay to really bring what you're passionate about, um, what you feel politically, um, um, and just your own, your own family story. And through those relationships, what is, what is my main goal? To get our people to Israel. The more they go to Israel, the better they are going to be as Israel educators, the more equipped they're going to be to be on college campuses. We've got to get them to Israel. And they're going to do that not solely from curriculum. They're going to do that by, um, by enduring relationships. So that's what we work hard at. 
Um, I would say we're not doing a good enough job. I mean, I think we're a new school. And so I think one of the things we've tried to have some humility about are what are the things that we knew we had to do excellently and what are the things that we want to do well and know that given how hard the Jewish day schools have spent a lot of time and a lot of resources on, that there doesn't seem to be such a, you know, when we looked at what is a good writing curriculum for kids with language-based learning disabilities, there's a lot of agreement. There's a lot of research. I think the question around Israel education has been much more muddied. And as we've certainly reached out to schools and schools have been tremendously generous with us in terms of sharing what they're doing, what we find is there's a lot more complexity to it. And I think one of the things that we, I mean, our kids are also most, you know, our oldest students are sixth graders and our youngest are second graders. I find that one of the challenges that we face is what, how do you help children learn about anything that's far away? So this is, for the students who've been to Israel many times, it's one, it's one experience. For a child who's never been to Israel, I mean, we're right now teaching India in our second, third grade, and I watch how confused they are. Where is India? What is India? And how do you, and nevertheless, and, and obviously we have much bigger aspirations and commitments for their connection and relationship to Israel, but I find that, that helping us to try to figure out how to do it with, where it's not about falafel and how it's not only about the political, you know, p praying for the peace of Israel, I think has been a real challenge for us and... Um, something that I hope we're going to continue to grow and develop as we as we grow. And also I would say the only other thing is there's tremendous fear. And one of the things I would say is our teachers who feel really comfortable teaching so many topics um, that when they when they know that they need to be talking about Israel and teaching about Israel, that there is much more anxiety about messing it up, about what can they say, about what can they not say. And the truth is, so much of what we want them to say is actually probably not very controversial, but I think there's so much fear surrounding the topic that it means that that there's sort of an, an additional barrier that I think is that is painful. I'll just say something very brief. Um, I think we shouldn't, as when I've been, a, I was a lower school principal for seven years and I've worked in high school for seven years. Um, and I think in lower school, we shouldn't be apologetic about going with falafel and kachol lavan. I think that that's become like this buzzword that we shouldn't be doing so much of, but I think actually it's okay. Um, and I think in high school, we shouldn't be afraid of teaching complexity. And we need to row both those oars very, very strongly. OK, I think we only have one uh, question left. Okay, so for the purpose of the live space. It's a great selling point. <laughs> they come home tired and dirty. That's all they need is a bath. That's the only home. You home. have homework. Right. One. Right. Um, I am a person who, in general, doesn't believe in homework, although I've come to appreciate um, the value of homework. And for us at the Chef of School, homework is about review. Homework is about being able not to try to learn new things, but it's an opportunity for children to do something independently. Um, our view is it's not homework to test what parents know, but it's a way, for, actually, it's a form of assessment for us. If a child is unable to complete their homework, that says that we didn't do enough, to, we didn't teach it well enough yet. And we really encourage parents to, or the children, just to come back and say, couldn't do it. And that's really good feedback back and information for us. Um, the second thing I would say is the value of homework is just some amount of sort of executive functioning, some amount of children just learning to take some responsibility, learning how to plan, learning how to organize, and I think that that is a tremendously valuable um, thing for children to learn, to learn that if this is due on Wednesday and then other t assignment is due on Friday, I mean, that kind of organizational piece I think has value. I don't think you need six hours of homework to be able to learn that skill. That could be a very short amount of, a short assignment, but just that you can be able to get, achieve those goals of review and of being able to learn some of that organizational skills without having to pile on tremendous homework. But I don't have a high school, so that may make it easier. But. I'll just say I agree with everything you said. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'm looking at my watch and it's a few minutes after nine, which is when we uh, promised to close this. Um, I think that our panelists will hang around for a few minutes after if you didn't get to ask a question that you want to or something burning that's come up uh, as people have been talking. Um, before we close, I want to give a shameless plug for the next panel in this series, which is part two on Tuesday, April 5th at 7.30 in the same place. Um, our topic is forecasting Jewish education, how to stay relevant for the next 20 years. Our panelists are Lisa Exler, sister of Rav Steven, uh, David Breifman, and um, someone who's going to replace Maya Bernstein, who is not going to be joining our panel. But sh uh, she's fine, but she's not going to be in the panel. Um, thank you all very much for coming this evening. Thank you to our panelists for engaging us in not straightforward topics. And uh, have a good evening.